I'm so pleased now to be joined by James Devlin. I remember your days as a Patriot, three-time Super Bowl champ, and now you're doing a lot in your retirement uh, away from the football field. Thanks for being with me. What's life like uh, as a non-football player? Uh, it's, it's been it's been really good. I mean, uh, I retired into COVID, which was which was a, a difficult situation for I think everyone in the country. Um, but honestly, I had a good chance to really slow life down a little bit, enjoy my family. Um, we went from a family of five to six in this past year. And, uh, and yeah, so just really been enjoying my time with my kids and, you know, being a dad, being a husband, um, and then also kind of getting into my own, uh, you know, endeavors, either entrepreneurially or other, you know, business ventures. And, um, you know, it's been, it's been really rewarding and, and, you know, also, uh, pretty reflective of who I really am. Yeah. Congratulations. I'm one of six kids, actually. So I know how valuable that time is and I'm certainly close with them. So I'm glad you're able to to transition to this next phase of your life and spend more time with your family. You know, a lot of times we we kind of observe from the outside what that transition is like. And I've talked to a lot of football players um, who have become analysts or who work in sports now. um, And they've they've all kind of shared different stories about either the difficulty of transition away from football or how refreshing it's been, you know, to, to start your career now in the business space, to, to Mm -hmm. become a a business owner, like you said, and a venture capitalist, you know, not only um, in this period of just enormous volatility, but Mm -hmm. how, how difficult or what kind of, what was your takeaway from, from that transition experience? Did you find it to be difficult? Did you find it to be exciting? Uh, yeah, so it's de- there's definitely two sides to the coin. Um, there's definitely a sign, like a sense of relief, because football and like playing at that level, there's so much stress involved. There's so many, you know, demands that we put on our body, but then demands that we, you know, spend time away from our family. That we're, you know, constantly being critiqued for our performance and trying to be, you know, as perfect as we possibly can. So lifting that weight of our, off our shoulders is is really a nice thing. But then you you also have the other side where all the all the pleasures that you enjoy while you're playing, you know, being part of a team, uh, being kind of on the inside of things, which is something that I've really um, is I've really been missing as of late and. Uh, you know, it's, I don't know, when I retired last year and it, it was like the whole COVID year, right? And it was a little bit easier to kind of forget uh, what I was missing because there wasn't as much media, you know, coverage. There wasn't, um, there wasn't fans in the stands. So watching games was even kind of strange. And now this year, like things have kind of gotten back to normal and I'm watching the Patriots and the Patriots are becoming the Patriots that, you know, I was used to, you know, and, they were winning gritty games like on Monday night, you know, running the ball uh, 46 times. And um, those are the type of games that I love. You know, as a fullback, you, you always kind of hope for those snowy, cold games where you're just going to, you know, ground and pound. Um, so recently I've been really like, man, I really miss football these days. And it's it's just tough. It's it's almost like kind of like a, a breakup that I I invested 25 years of my life to the game of football and now all of a sudden like it's gone it's continuing on and being successful and now like I just you know, I'm sit here and I don't have football in my life anymore so to speak. Yeah you know I I thought of you about that Monday night game and I was wondering kind of what you just detailed what you must have been experiencing watching that from the couch and seeing the exact game that's almost tailor-made for for somebody that played your position when you only have the quarterback throw it three times and you're seeing them rush time and time and time again. Um, I want to ask you about that game, but I just want to punctuate this this with, you know, the the idea that you have – logistically so much structure as a football player. I mean, do people not understand how difficult that that part is to, to have everyone go from telling you when to be there, when to lift weights, when to eat, when to sleep, you know, when to look at the playbook to having making those decisions on your own? I mean, you know, there's that big kind of larger discussion about are we preparing college football players enough for everything that comes with being a professional athlete if they're fortunate enough like you were to do so? And, mm-hmm. you know, I think part of that, too, is just mentally kind of wrapping your mind around like what's next when you've been in such a structured environment. Did you have to put structure in place? 
Oh, absolutely. And that, that is a that is a great point that I think is kind of swept under the rug a lot, um, is that when you're a professional athlete, there's you said it perfectly. There's so much structure to your day, to your week, to really the entire year um, or season, especially. I mean, you're constantly being told what you got to work on, what you got to do, where you got to be, who you got to talk to, everything. Um, and now all of a sudden, you know, you're out in the real world and no one's holding your hand through, you know, whatever, whatever you got to do on a daily basis. Um, so there is definitely like a, a, like a self-regulation trial and error period for me. Um, and I'm, and I'm really learning now, like what works, what kind of gets me up and going every single day and like what I can really hang my hat on as far as like my just normal daily patterns that help me to stay focused on the tasks at hand. Um, I think that is, that is something that's really, that should be, you know, kind of addressed more. Um, because when, when I was playing, frankly, I didn't have enough time to really think about, you know, life after football or those things. I kind of, I always say I had blinders on and it was just football and nothing else. Like I just didn't have time for the other things. Um, and Bill used to always say, like, in the beginning of the season, you know, all the stuff you have going on at home or, you know, other businesses, whatever, put all that stuff in the drawer and file it away until after the season. Then you, you can deal with it. But when you're when you're in the facility, when the season's going on, you just frankly don't have enough time or, or mental bandwidth to, to juggle all those things at once. Um, so, yeah, being being now on this side of the game of football, um, I'm definitely like learning, you know, the patterns that work for me. And thankfully, you know, football kind of teaches you that discipline. And there's a lot of just, you know, general life lessons in the game of football that you can carry on and uh, continue to do those things just in a different capacity or different field. Yeah, that part of it is fascinating to me. And you are far from the only player that's experienced that that kind of abrupt change in lifestyle. And I think if you don't have the discipline or didn't come out of a locker room like the Patriots locker room, where, like you said, is so regimented and Bill is is so disciplined. If you didn't have that leadership or a role model like that to kind of set the foundation for the next step, even though you have to compartmentalize basically your entire life for however many years you play, um, I think it can land you in, in a really tough place. And so I'm fascinated by that. Because I think it can it can lend itself to depression and some of these other issues that we need mm -hmm. to talk about. Um, aside from the mental part of it, the physical transformation for a lot of players, you know, like yourself, is stunning as well. And I know you ran the Boston Marathon, so I'm yeah. sure you got a little bit lighter in the loafers over over right. that experience. What was that like for you? Yeah, so I always really appreciated the uh, the training aspect of of being a professional athlete. Like I took that very seriously. That was. That was kind of my MO while I was playing was I was constantly trying to get as strong as possible, trying to lift all the weights in the gym, that kind of thing. Um, I was a big time meathead, you know, while I was in New England. Um, and then, yeah, so I definitely, I, when I retired, there was less like of a performance based approach to my training because I didn't have to be that strong anymore. Um, although I still kind of just generally competitive with myself I want to be stronger I want to look better I want to be able to you know do anything my kids ask me because <laughs> ask me all the time like oh daddy were you the strongest football player and I was like I don't know what do you think yeah <laughs> but uh, um yeah so while I was you know I, when I retired and you know I didn't really have like the Sundays to look forward to and like to you know put my all my work on display um, I was starting to kind of like consider like what what's another challenge that I can take on, you know, something that's maybe, you know, out of my comfort zone or what have you. And um, and I kind of I remembered in 2018, Ryan Mundell came back uh, up to Boston to run the marathon. And I talked to him about it and I said, you know what, that's a really cool opportunity to do something in in the town that or the city that we're you know so intimate with. Um and I said, you know, what? That, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to kind of change from lifting all these weights to just hitting the road as much as I can. And um, and I'm really glad that I did it. I did it for the Joe and Jersey Foundation and uh, raised a lot of money for a really good cause and helping families deal with the financial burden of, of a cancer diagnosis in the New England area. And um, 
you know, it was just, uh, it was a really cool experience, you know, something I had never really run more than maybe four or five miles at a time before that. And uh, I definitely got, you know, a little leaner, but I still ran the race at 245 and I played at 255, 260. So I wasn't that much lighter in the loafers, but uh, it was a really cool experience. And honestly, kind of came back, it became more of a mental thing really than anything. And that's what I really appreciated about it. You know, when you're running for three, four, four and a half hours out on the road, like you have a lot of time to just think. And uh, and I did some of my best thinking about just <laughs> my life and what I want to do with it and, you know, what I want to do in, in the business space or venture capital space and all this, all these things. So um, that was a really cool takeaway from all that. Yeah, big congratulations to you for that. And what a great charitable effort as well to kind of place your motivation in too. I think it's, it's crazy when you start, you know, running a couple of miles, and then all of a sudden, you're out there on a Saturday for like three or four hours, just inside your head, it's an amazing transition. And even for somebody that's not an athlete, like, like myself, when you, when you do it, you just you realize that you can accomplish so much more, I think, than than maybe you thought you could. Um, just kind of going back to the Patriots here, I know you mentioned you were salivating as a former fullback over that game on Monday night, and I understand why. The the fullback position, I'm sure you guys don't get nearly enough credit for for some of the blocks that that you've made over the course of your career, especially during that period where you won three Super Bowls. I mean, when you think back to your career and some of those short yardage situations, is there like a block or two that that stand out for you, or a funny moment that stands out for you that that is at the top of the list for you? Oh, absolutely. And I I, I lived for those like goal line short yardage situations where it was honestly like. I knew I was going to try to meet somebody in the phone booth and um, and just, you know, who who has a little bit more like mustard to him, I uh, was going to win that. And so favorite blocks, I mean, um, two of the probably the most, you know, I'd say the, the most recent in my memory um, happened in the last Super Bowl when we beat the Rams, Super Bowl 53. Uh, first play of the game, I had a wham on Ndamukong Sue, and I was I was a little rattled after the open kickoff. I was in the wedge, and I got I got stuck pretty well, um, and we had a good return. Uh, but you know, I was and I was dealing with an injury that I didn't even know that ended up um, you know ending my career. Uh, and then I, I you know I'm in the huddle, and I know I got Sue on the first play. We had scripted it up, and um, I knew he was going to be you know, geeked and ready to go on the first snap of the game. And, but Hey, I did my thing. I got in his way. At least he put me on the, on the ground, but we got 13 yards and that, you know, that's what a fullback supposed to do is just kind of sacrifice themselves. Um, but I was definitely, you know, displeased with myself after that play, but I'm, uh, I'm proud of the fact the way, you know, we ended the game. And, um, and then I was, the second play was the, uh, the only touchdown of the game was Sony behind me down on the goal line, um, hit Mark Barron and got him pretty well. And we scored and then uh, ended up winning the game. And we kind of, you know, more or less ran the, ran the ball to eat up the clock at the end of the game. And it was just, uh, it was just a really cool kind of started, started one way, getting kind of embarrassed in front of the, you know, the whole world. And then, you know, ended uh, back on top. And so, I always kind of I appreciate that even in one game you can kind of have like a roller coaster of emotions and um, I was I was proud of the of the fact that I kind of stuck to my my bearings a little bit and was able to come back and finish the game strong. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, when you look at the the NFL today and you you really just got out of the league, mm -hmm. um, it seems like and you tell me because you would know better than me that teams are you know, more and more becoming faster, more athletic, placing mm -hmm. emphasis on those speed guys, maybe choosing a receiver over a, you know, a stalwart back or, or choosing somebody in between the trenches is where is the fullback position headed? I mean, is, is, what are you seeing? I think, and I've been, I've been campaigning this for a couple of years now. Um, I think the game of football is a very cyclic thing. And I think, you know, while, Maybe back in like the 90s, the fullback was, you know, every team had them and they had running backs like, you know, Jerome Bettis back there that were just like, we we're going to run the ball 30 to 40 times this game, whether you like it or not. We'll stick some passes in there to keep you honest. But that was just football in the 90s, you know, and now 
you know, throughout my career, it kind of got like you exactly like you said, defenses um, started getting a little smaller because offenses started passing the ball more. And now we're seeing linebackers, you know, that used to be Ray Lewis, Brian Erlocker, Patrick Willis at 250 pounds. Um, you know, now they're 230. Now they're 225. And so I think you're starting to see a little bit of more of a resurgence for some of these teams that, you know, run the ball very heavily, the Titans, the Browns, the Patriots, the Colts. And now they're the teams that are the Ravens. I mean, they're, you know, they're all running the ball heavily. Their backs are really good. You know, they have a really good scheme to them. And, uh, and now those are the teams that are, you know, the top of the standings. And I don't think it's just a coincidence. I think it's just the way that, football is eventually going to come back around because everyone's always looking for that strategic advantage. And when you just look at it on paper, you say, you know what, well, these, uh, these defenses are getting a little smaller. Um, and so let's just stick a fullback there, back there and let them, let them, you know, run the ball and, and beat them up a little bit. And I think you're starting to see, you know, that, that kind of come back into trend a little bit. I don't know why I feel like Bill Belichick, maybe it's because of his, you know, defensive mind or whatever it is. I, I feel like he's the kind of guy who would not abandon that position or wouldn't jump to whatever's trendy if he feels like you said, if he's reading the tea leaves and feels like it is cyclical or just sees a need on the field that, you know, that he can address with somebody that plays your position. I mean, is he one of the coaches or is the Patriots one of the coaching staff? I know you just mentioned them as a team that is implementing the run you know what why do I feel that way what is it about him that that would lead you to believe that he's not going to change something just because it's trendy if that makes sense yeah I think uh, I think it's his historical knowledge of the game of football and that's I mean he is he is like you know obviously so smart and so well versed in in football but he's also like he he craves more and more knowledge and more and more understanding of of football what's happened in the past and then how that will be eventually reflected in the future and so i think he understands you know um there's definitely a need for a fullback there's a need for a strong run game at some point throughout the year and i think that's that you know, Josh McDaniels also believes in that. He likes a multiple off offense that can attack you in a multitude of ways because each week you see a different opponent, opponent, they have different strengths. So you need to be able to like kind of morph and do what you need to do to put yourself in a, in a good, good uh, strategic position against that team. Um, so, you know, whether it was one game, we'd run the ball 40 times and we'd have 200 yards rushing. And then the next week we'd, throw the ball 40 times and Tom would have 400 yards and five touchdowns. And it was just like, well, what do you want to do to, what do you want to try to stop? Cause we have it all, you know? And so I think just being complete in that way is, it was always Josh's uh, kind of approach to our offense. And then I think Bill just truly understands the game of football better than anyone I've ever met. And, um, you know, I think I'd, I'd go as far to say anybody in the league. I mean, he just, he always is is trying to learn more and more and more about you know just what it takes to win, and I think that's one of the mo one of the things I learned about him that I truly admire the most is that he just has no ego. He's always willing to learn. He's always willing to say like, I know I've won six championships, but there's more. There's more out there, and that's you know each year is a new year. Those six championships don't mean anything in the 2021 season. So what can I do for this team to be, you know, at the at the top in the end? And so he's just always willing to learn and and uh, and change what he needs to do to to get himself to, in those positions. Yeah, that's fascinating to hear that he's more of a student still of the mm -hmm. game than a lot of people realize, myself included, because you think about him as a coach that has seen it all, done it all, knows it all, that sort of a thing. And you know, it, everyone constantly tries to to pick him apart. I mean, we we beat that storyline of, of him versus Tom when Tom was leaving for Tampa into the ground, trying to assess from the outside, well, who's right and who's wrong? 
wrong and how did it work and who's better. And um, it's just interesting to kind of get some insight from you into who he actually is, because I'm not sure. I'm sure it's by design, but I'm not sure he gives, you know, everybody a real portrait or look into the kind of coach that that he was. I mean, you mentioned that he asked you at at the beginning of the year, listen, everybody's got to put everything in a drawer because it's all Mm -hmm. football all the time. And, you know, to hear you kind of detail uh, really interestingly and, and meticulously just kind of how he studies the game. Is there anything else that that we don't know about him that that you always found kind of really impressive or fascinating about him? Does he have a funny, irreverent side that he never shows anybody else? Oh, absolutely. I mean, he is he is quietly one of the funniest guys. Um, I don't know whether it's just the the level of power that he has in that organization and his ability to then like, you know, get right down to like being a personable, just another one of the guys um, he just has that like ability to kind of play both sides of the fence, which is which is beautiful, and he handles it so perfectly. Like there's team meetings where he's got the, the team like cracking up because he's like you know picking somebody apart on film or um, you know, and he's just and one of the one of the things that really impressed me the most um, is yeah we see this the uh, kind of the the media's perception of bill and like this monotone kind of like i don't i don't care kind of thing and um but that's far from who he truly is he is so like personable and he really cares about each and every player and that's another thing you kind of see you think like bill is one of those guys that just like choose through his players and he's just like oh, i want to just win 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 but you know i i was you know in a position where I, I was having kids while I was playing. My wife was having kids, I should say. Um, but we were building a family while I was playing. And he was always like, hey, family first. Like, for football will still be here tomorrow. You know, you're about to have your your daughter here in the middle of the playoffs. Go and be with your wife, you know. Um, there was no question of those things. And I think that's one thing is, like, you, you see this guy in the media – and he seems like it's just all football all the time. I don't want to hear anything else. He has his priorities in life, and he and he expects us to have our own priorities in life. He knows that we're human beings, um, and he appreciates, you know, his players' um, priorities and where and what they deem important to them. And so that's something I've always really respected about him. It seems like New England is a locker room, is a place for um, a certain kind of player, you know, somebody that wants to be responsible and show up and do what's expected of them and follow the rules, I guess. Mm -hmm. At least it seems like that to me Um, is, would you want to play anywhere else having the experience that you had in new England? Oh, absolutely not. And I, and I told my wife, Jenny, that I told Bill that when we were in like the free agent negotiation thing, once I got a taste of, of the new England way, um, and I felt how how much I fit in there. I knew I wasn't playing anywhere else. I mean, when it came down to like you know me going into free agency, it really wasn't even a question. Um, you know, it was just like you know what are you willing to do? And I'm signing on the dotted line. Like there's nothing. <laughs> there's you know no 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 playing hardball. Um, it is it is a beautiful kind of thing that they've built there. Um, you know, I really, truly appreciated it. I appreciated how it really didn't matter where you came from, what your story was before you got into that locker room. It was all about what you did on the practice field and on the game field. That's all that mattered, you know, and that's how you earned your respect in there. Um, and there was just that that overwhelming sense of accountability that if you like that kind of thing, um, then you're going to thrive there. But if if you struggle with that accountability and that like kind of pressure to do your job and do it the right way and put all things aside, um, then it might not, you know, be the place for you. But for someone like me that I always, I always wanted that out of the game of football. It's kind of what I gravitated towards throughout my football career. And so it just, it really seemed to fit me. And I think you can kind of see that through the, through the guys, you know, the, the Teddy Bruskies, the Julian Edelmans, the Troy Browns, you know, the Kevin Falk, all these guys, like they kind of fit this certain mold. And then and then the Patriots kind of like become 
them, so to speak. So it's, it's, uh, yeah, I wouldn't have played anywhere else. Long story short. Yeah. And you've got all these like-minded players who assume the mantle when the Fox or the Brewskis or whoever, you know, leave, it's almost mm-hmm. like you got, then you've got the McCordy's you've got all these guys who are natural leaders. Um, so as you kind of assess this year's team, it's been interesting to watch Bill Belichick coach Matt Jones. And we've seen some really interesting moments between the two. And he's certainly been frustrated at times. And then we mentioned the game on Monday night. Now they find themselves at the top of the conference when at one point, you know, whatever, a month plus ago, you're thinking that they really, really stink. I mean, no offense. <laughs> um, what's your assessment of how good they are and what do you see for them in the playoffs? Well, I, I don't know what I see for him in the playoffs. I mean, well, that's to be determined. Um, I think that's the Patriot in me speaking is you don't want to get ahead of yourself and start looking towards the playoffs. I mean, they still have four games to play. But I will tell you this. I think every every year we won the Super Bowl, we were always met with some kind of like um, adversity throughout the year, whether it was early or late in the year. You need like an experience to really galvanize you as a team. And uh, and I think they saw that when they started the year two and four and, team, and you know, media is writing them off. Everyone, oh, the Patriots aren't the Patriots anymore. Well, now here they are sitting at nine and four and everyone's singing their praises. And it really in the building that that stuff doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if you're two and four. It doesn't matter nine if you're nine and four and that num- the one number one seed like all you're trying to do is worry about the next week and win that game. That's it. And that's the beauty of Bill Belichick and the Patriots is they're just focused on one thing. And that's, you know, resting up in this bye week that they have right now and coming back and playing the Colts playing well and winning. And uh, so I think that's what they're, that's what they're focused on. But I think that early season adversity, you can tell how much the team enjoys playing enjoys playing for each other and with each other. And, uh, and they just seem like they're having fun. And that's honestly one of the hardest things for, for me to see, because I loved being part of that, that kind of like um, bonding, those bonding moments, you know, when people are t- counting you out, oh, Tom Brady's too old, oh, the offense stinks, they can't run the ball. And then you do that and then you do it again and again. And now all of a sudden, like they're singing your praises, like, you know, kind of, it making making people eat their crow is one of the best things as far as uh, t- building a team throughout a season. So I think it's uh, I think, it you know, the the writing is on the wall and I think they got a lot of a lot of football yet to play. But I like the way they're playing right now. Yeah, I'm sure there's nothing that makes you want to absorb a huge hit on fourth and two than somebody telling you that you're not good enough and you're not going to go anywhere. <laughs> um, just last one for you, because I don't want to I know I've kept you probably too long already. If if they are able to kind of ride this momentum and the locker room has been galvanized, like you say, do you think that it will be the offense or the defense that carries them where they need to go? Hmm. Good question. I think uh, I think this defense is something special, really. Um, you know, it, defense. You know, you always hear that thing: offense wins games, defense wins championships. Um, and the defense just seems to like week in and week out, just keep them in games and make incredible plays and just really they they keep putting the ball back in in Mac Jones's hands and the offense's hands and I love to see that um but I think it'll take both because you know like I said before you play a new team each week and those teams have different strengths and weaknesses so I think there's some weeks where the defense is going to carry the offense and there's going to be some weeks where the offense carries the defense and that's a game and that is a game of football and that's the beauty in it is that it takes the whole team, not just 11 guys on one night. It takes all the whole 46 man game day roster, 53 man, 60 guys plus, you know, practice squad. It takes every single one of them to do their job each week to win week in and week out in the NFL. And so I think, you know, it's it's really a team effort. It's not just the offensive defense. Because you mentioned how big the team is, just real quick, you know, Bill Belichick gets a lot of the credit when Josh McDaniels gets a ton of credit. I'm sure they both deserve it. On the coaching staff, what's one name, one face that you think, I mean, offensively, obviously, probably, but even on the defensive side that you're like, man, this guy is is so good and he never really gets the credit he deserves. Is there a guy um, like that? 
I could list them all. I could list them all throughout the years. I mean, you've seen a lot of these guys get, you know, great opportunities like the Joe judges and, um, you know, but Nick Cayley, my tight end coach, absolute just grinder works so, so hard, such a good human being just like truly cares about his players. And you're starting to see that the tight end and the fullback position, you know, is just, it's, it's, they're playing very, very well in New England. Um, you know, Gerard Mayo, uh, the Belichick uh, brothers, like those guys, all they, all they know in the, in the New England coaching staff is work. And they, they put in so, so many hours and they're away from their families and they're just, they're just grinding. I mean, Cam Acord, the, the special teams coordinator, just an absolute grinder, puts the team in the, in the right position to make the plays, you know, on the, in a very important but overlooked uh, aspect of the game of football. Um, Ivan Fear has been there for like 30 some years. Absolutely love the guy running back coach. And you see what the, the success that that room is having right now. And I mean, that you gotta, you gotta give some credit to him. Um, yeah. I mean, the list goes on and on. It really does. I mean, they, you know, even some of the, like the new guys, Troy Brown and, um, Vinny Sanceri, just I know the type of work ethics that they have because I've either played with them or seen them around the facility so long. I mean, the assistant coaches really, they they do so much of that, like just gritty work, and you love to see it, and you need those guys um, to enjoy the team's success like they've been having. Yeah. James, this has been a real pleasure. Thank you so much for your insight. Um, if anybody wanted to say they're a Patriots fan or whatever, and they wanted to support you in your new endeavors, uh, your business, can you tell us a little bit about how they can follow you or where they might find you? Sure. Yeah. So I'm on uh, social media wise, I'm on Instagram, um, jdev, at jdevlin, and then um, I'm on LinkedIn, but I'm relatively new to LinkedIn. So, but it's just uh, James Devlin. I have two E's in my name, which sometimes people mix that up, but um, yeah, I mean, come, uh, you know, follow me, check me out, try to connect with me on LinkedIn. If, if you want to, you know, talk more of a, of a business, uh, side of things, but yeah, um, you know, I'm very approachable and love to talk to anyone who's interested. So well, best of luck to you. Thanks for being with us. Thank you very much for having me. I appreciate it.